This is Tetris, the most sold game in history. And this is Tetris inside the game Rust. Using only logic gates, I created a fully playable version, complete with rotation, scoring and more. It's the newest platform in a long list of Tetris adaptations, adding yet another chapter to its legacy. It's the perfect game. Tetris? Tetris. 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 To figure out how to make Tetris, we first have to know what Tetris exactly is. But here's the first problem. You see, there isn't one definite version telling us how it works, but rather it has more iterations than Skyrim. Some of my favorites include Super Tetris 3, Tetris 4D, Tetris 64, Tetris the Absolute, the Grandmaster 2 Plus. And these are just the official ones. Like, did the world really need Tetris X Hello Kitty? You tell me. Luckily, there's one place containing all the variations and deviations of the game. The Tetris Wiki is the go-to bible on the correct and rightest way to make Tetris. This shall be our main source I'll reference. According to them, Tetris is played on a grid 10 cells wide and 20 cells high. One of seven pieces called Tetronomos will fall down. The fall is only stopped by the bottom or other Tetronomos. Afterwards, the next piece will spawn. This loop repeats and slowly the game board fills up. The player, however, can combat this by moving and rotating the pieces to create full horizontal lines. Should a line be filled, it is cleared and all the pieces above fall down, creating a simple yet addictive gameplay loop. On top there are rules and mechanics as hold and back and super rotation, t-spin detection and so much more. Yeah, we won't be able to get all of these. Therefore my baseline for this project is create a rudimentary adaptation, add possible mechanics, make it fun and make it look pretty. These may sound like simple tasks, but remember everything will be made in an environment that usually focuses on invading your neighbor's private space, therefore it will be anything but simple, though with determination and clever thought we shall get there. All we got in Rust are wires changing from 0 to 1 and back. Not very impressive. To create more complex mechanics we need to use logic gates altering the flow of electricity and giving us more functionality. Let's start with the basics. All we want to do right now is to move a single one by one piece across our screen. For the screen itself we can use lamps representing our pixels. Each pixel position can be represented by two variables, one in the x-axis and one in the y-axis. Behind the screen we lay down one wire for each possible X position and another one for each possible Y position. This way we can choose a specific pixel. We do so by powering the respective wires. But here's the problem, the lamp won't light up yet. Why? Because there is no connection between the light and the X and Y wires at the moment. To fix this we need something that only activates when both the X and the Y wire are on. Here comes the end gate. It's perfect for this. The end gate powers the lamp only when both the input wires are on. And just like this we have lit up our first pixel. By adding an end gate for every possible pixel we can control any location we want. This is just a very small and simple example to give you an idea how we can create complex behavior out of simple parts. A circuit more complex is the shift register. It allows us to store a variable that we can increase and decrease, just what we need for our X and Y. We hook up one shift register for both. Left and right increases or decreases the X variable and up and down the Y variable. Now we can move our piece freely around. We repeat the same setup for another pixel. The only difference is that the position is one to the right, giving us a size two by one. Two more pieces and we have our first tetronomo, already looking quite familiar. It doesn't stop there, as we need to repeat it for all the possible pieces. Once done, we have a nice setup that allows us to turn on and off these switches representing the desired piece. 
the circuit then will automatically project it onto the screen at the current position. In the final version, we obviously don't want to toggle these switches manually. Instead, we create a lookup table containing the information for each piece. Now we just input the number of the piece that we want and it automatically will show it on the screen. Put a piece here, put a piece there! Use your thumbs, use your eyes! Find yourself, tetracized! To give it a nice spin, we need working rotation. Achieving this is actually quite simple. We use the lookup table and add three more entries, representing the same piece but with a different rotation. Now we have these additional inputs for rotation. We end up with one button for rotation left and another one for rotation right. Movement and rotation combined makes for pretty much all the necessary controls to get a piece around the display. Speaking of which, let's talk about the display situation for a moment. One thing your keen eye might have noticed is that our pieces are a little bit different than the normal Tetris pieces. They all have the same color compared to regular pieces that come in all different color variation. It is even written down what piece should have what color. Here we find our biggest limitation. Unfortunately there is no easy way to make color coded pieces in Rust. Don't get me wrong, there are colored lights, but a green light will always be green and a red light will always stay red. Color blending is possible, but without the blue light, our display would only be RG instead of RGB. Well, if only Face Punch could add a multicolored light, wouldn't that be something? However, a thing we can actually do is automatic falling. We add a clock and wire it up to the down input, letting the piece fall down on its own. And when the piece hits the ground, we want to spawn a new piece, giving us already a quite nice mock-up. And what is this button for? It's the subscribe button, which is directly connected to your inbox so you don't miss any videos. You need a touch Tetris. In our current version, we only have one piece at a time. There's no way for us to save a fallen piece. Ideally, we want to have a place that stores all the blocks occupied. Storing data sounds a lot like a task for the memory. Let us introduce the static memory. Once a piece hits the bottom, we want to save it at the same location in this memory. We create this by just having memory cells for each of the 200 game tiles enabling us to toggle any of them on or off. To make it visible as well, we hook it up to the game screen. That way the screen will display both the falling piece and the saved ones. As you can see here, the piece falls down and once it hits the ground, gets successfully stored in our static memory. Though, as we don't check for any collisions, our pieces still can overlap, which isn't ideal. With the new static memory, we can easily fix this. In this example, we want to move down. Before we actually do so, we should check if there are any blocks underneath. And if so, we shouldn't move down. This process is repeated for left and right, and afterwards we have some solid collision. A problem our collision detection is not accounting for is rotation. What if we rotate a piece here? the new position would overlap with the static block. If this were a program, we would simply check what the new rotation would look like and do a collision check for each of the blocks. But in Rust we would need to rotate the piece first, check if it's colliding with anything and revert back if it does. This isn't really performant on runtime and could confuse players. One solution would be to have two additional falling screens both having the same piece at the same position, but rotated to the left or right. That way we could easily check for any potential collisions. It would also mean 8000 additional components. This is not an option. So we'll have to surrender on this one. And don't even ask if the game supports T-spins. Like the piece is here and ends up over there. How am I supposed to explain that? When things start changing right before your eyes, you've been tetricized! Checking for a full row is easy. We just look if all the 10 blocks in a row are on in the static memory. The part more difficult is what comes next. 
We want to clear every full row and move every line above downwards for each dissolved one. For one row it's trivial, but remember up to four rows could be cleared simultaneously. The solution I settled on just breaks the problem down in one check at a time. If the game notices one or more full rows, it will clear the lowest of them and move all the blocks above down by one. Afterwards, it just checks again and repeats this process up to four times. Finally, we have the back and forth that makes Tetris so addicting. Let's see what's next. No, literally, Tetris shows you the next piece that will be falling down. For this we introduce the next piece, which is between the generation and the actual piece we currently have on screen. To showcase it, we put a small display next to the game as an indicator. Now this makes you wonder where the pieces come from. As of now, they are just randomly generated, but humans aren't good with randomness. And it's frustrating to wait for that one long piece that would just fit so nicely, if only you had one. To combat this, modern Tetris games use something called the bag. At the beginning, a new bag is generated, containing all the seven different pieces. When a new piece is needed, it just takes one from the bag. Rinse and repeat until the bag gets empty, at which point you just open a new one. This simple mechanic allows for more predictable randomness, as the longest you will have to wait for a piece is 13. Another quality of life feature offered by some versions is the hold mechanic. Just like the name would imply, it allows the player to hold on for a piece Maybe one piece isn't fitting and it would be better at a later stage. Luckily we can repurpose the same logic from the next piece indicator. This time we just swap between the active piece and the held piece. Have you been Square, rectangle, trapezoid, tetrazoid. How exactly is the Tetris score calculated? Well, it depends mainly on two things the level you are on and how many rows you clear at once. These two factors get multiplied. If you fill up one row in level 4, you get 1 times 4. Clearing three rows at the same gives you a multiplier of 5, meaning in level 4 you would get 20. These sound like some heavy calculations to handle. Well, if only somebody already made a calculator in Rust, wouldn't that be nice? So I made this glorious contraption, taking in both level and tracking the rows cleared simultaneously to add to the final score. Technically there are even more multipliers. Good thing we ruled out T-spins in the previous segment. At the end I hooked it all up to the main game. I took some liberty with speeds and level up to make the game a little bit more fun. With all of that combined, I consider this part a job well done. You know what they say, it's what's on the inside that counts. Well, this project certainly has that part covered, if you don't look too closely anyway. But here's the thing, I still want to show it off to my friends. Time for a makeover. My plan is to build a gigantic Game Boy and smack it down in the middle of my Rust map. Of course, step one was finding a gigantic Game Boy. But surprise the price, nobody is selling one online. So I had to make it myself, using a tool called Rust Edit, which lets you tweak maps to your heart's content. I started getting the basic outline of the Game Boy using simple boxes. From there it was all about chiseling in details bit by bit, until it started looking like the real deal. By the end it turned out way better than I expected. It's a convincing replica, right down to the Tetris cartridge slotted into the back. One issue I ran into during my last big project was the insane lag. It is almost as if your client doesn't want to render 2000 components. So this time I came up with a sophisticated solution. We take the circuit and put it somewhere else. Now all the computation happens deep beneath the ocean. Finally we have a playable and good looking Tetris while still keeping a double digit frame rate. To round things out, I modeled a custom gamepad, which I promptly handed over to my friends to test. Okay, let's see how, how it goes. 
This is so nice. The music is so on point. Feels! Okay. Ooh. Ooh, even the sun. Oh, that's so nice. And the score is working now. Oh, this is Look cool. at this. You got nine, po uh, six points because you clear two rows, which is a multiplier of three, and you're le in level two. So three times two is six points. Yo, that's so cool. <laughs> nice. Sweet, man. This is sweet. Great job on this one. Well, thank you. At the end, this is just the next foothold in the long history of Tetris. But for myself, it was a major achievement. I made the biggest electrical contraption ever seen in Rust. Or may I say, the biggest so far. Subscribe to keep up with these projects and I see you in the next video. Splendid.